you would take your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 this morning, starting in verse 26. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 26 and going to verse 30. Then they sailed to the country of the gar- gardens, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. So Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. We're going to stop here for just a moment. You read this story, it's a fascinating story. Read the story how Jesus goes to a foreign land, there's a man there. It's quite the character. Scared me half to death. He comes running out and he's naked. That alone would do it, by the way. But it says here he was possessed by a legion of demons. Now look at what what people did to this man up to this point. They said that they had bound him with chains, he was under guard. They didn't know what to do with the man. It completely, completely was beyond their understanding as to what to do over this scenario. Also, look where the man was living. He was living not among the people. He was living in the tombs. He was living with the dead. And then Jesus showed up. Now, this is where the story gets really interesting. This is where everything starts to change. Because when Jesus comes in, he starts putting things in order. You know, when you come to Christ, everything's made new. 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of my favorite verses, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are gone, they've passed away. All things are made new. You've got a man here, he has been tormented for a long time, according to this passage, a long time. People have not known what to do with him. They cannot figure him out. They've put him under guard. They've bound him with chains. They've done everything they know to do. They can't fix the man. They're just trying to put him away. When Jesus comes on the scene, he starts making everything new. And the man, when he comes out of the tomb, he sees Jesus, and instantly the demons inside him respond to the presence of Jesus. Man, that's powerful right there. Hold your place for just a moment. I'm going to come right back to the story. But hold your place and go on over to Hebrews chapter 4. Because in Hebrews, it explains to us exactly what is taking place in this passage. And it gives us instruction even for today how we need to be living our lives. Listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Listen to that passage right there. And now look at the passage that we're reading here in Luke. The Bible says that the Word discovers our true condition. That nothing, no creature, great or small, spiritual or physical, nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Word of God. Now you look at this, you look in the book of Luke, what does it say? It says when this man came out of the tomb and saw Jesus, instantly the demons knew that they were seen. Instantly. They spoke and said, what have we to do with you, Jesus? Have you come to torment us before it's time? Nobody else could see it. Nobody else knew what was going on. They tried chains and everything else. This man was hiding among the dead. But when Jesus showed up, the Word of God saw the true condition of the man. He didn't see just the physical nakedness. He saw the spiritual nakedness. And everything was exposed and open to him who sees all. 
See, the Word of God, you can't hide anything from the Word of God. There is nothing hidden from the Word of God. And that makes it sometimes very uncomfortable because we want certain things to be hidden, don't we? We don't want everything to be seen. Why? For many reasons. But for one, it's shameful. We're ashamed of things that we've done. We've ashamed of mistakes, of things we let come into our life. But the Word of God exposes it. He says, I see it. And you say, Pastor, why is that so important that God see those things? Because how else are they going to get clean? How else are they going to get clean? My wife and I, we drive a, a white van. This time of year, you get salt, a lot of salt off the road, flies up on your vehicle. If you have a darker vehicle, you see the salt instantly. You see every little fleck and spot. You know where it's at. But if you drive a white vehicle, you can't see it. And here we've been driving around for a while. We bring the vehicle in. We park it in the garage. And all the ice and snow start melting off the van. And I go out there, and there's a salt crust on the floor of my, of my garage. I'm thinking, boy, I knew it was bad, but I had no idea it was that bad. So I'm going to have to take a power washer to this thing. Well, guess what? The Word of God exposes our condition. People saw this man, and they knew instantly. They thought, man, this is bad. Jesus showed up, and you find out there are legions of demons. Everyone was standing back saying, I knew it was bad. I had no idea it was this bad. But God says, but I can take care of it. I'm here to set the captives free. That's what the Word of God says. I'm here to set the captives free. That's why the Scripture in Hebrews is so important. And that's why it's important to be looking at Luke 8 when we read that passage because it shows you, number one, how God was able to see what was going on. Number two, it shows you the power of the Word of God even today. And number three, it shows you His ability to heal and transform. Because here Christ cast the demons out of this man and He's healed and He wants to follow Jesus Christ. Now you go back to Hebrews in chapter 4. And it tells us in verse 11, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. That word diligence is key, and you've got to put that down in your notes. Diligence is key. Because if you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to be able to see these things that are going on in your life, these things that need to be fixed that maybe you don't know is going on at the moment, then you've got to be diligent to search out the Word of God. Because the more Word that you put in you, the more you're going to be able to see around you. The more you're going to know what's dangerous, what's not dangerous, what you need to avoid, what you need to remove, the more words you put in, the better you are to see what's going on around you. I tell you, it's easy to be blind to it. It's easy. Just go back to Genesis. It says that Lot was a righteous man, but it says he lived in an extremely wicked town. He lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, right between the two. And it says by hearing and seeing their wicked deeds, that righteous spirit was oppressed day by day. What does oppression mean? It means I'm getting blinded. It means that now I'm not as sensitive as I used to be. It means that things are slipping up on me that used to would not slip up on me at all. I would know it beforehand. But the Word of God, was it, what does it do? It sharpens us. It opens our eyes. It opens our ears. It opens our hearts that we're sensitive to these things. We see them coming a ways off, and we get away from them. We get away from them. Why? Because I'm a new creation. I'm not who I used to be. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you go on further in Scripture. We've got so many examples of this. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We start looking at the ministry of Paul. And at this one particular point, Paul goes into the city of Ephesus. And he starts preaching and teaching the Word of God to the Ephesians. Now, many miracles were done for, uh, done for Paul. It says that even when a shadow would pass by somebody, a demon would be cast out or they'd be healed. A handkerchief that was anointed by Paul had the ability through the Spirit of God to heal somebody. It wasn't the handkerchief, it wasn't the anointing, it wasn't Paul. It was the fact that the Spirit of God rested so heavily on Paul that some strange things were happening because the Spirit of God does amazing things when it's present. Amen? But here we're looking in Scripture and some people saw this happening. And here's what they did. In, in Acts chapter, chapter 19, starting in verse 13, then some inerrant Jewish exorcist took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And an evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, 
Paul I know, but who are you? Oh, those are dangerous words. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. Those are dangerous words. Years ago when I was going to college, I was the chaplain of my university. And I got to minister to a lot of different people. Two individuals come to mind when I'm, when I'm talking about these things. I'll tell you one first. And I remember this young lady told me, she said, I don't know what's going on. She says, I'm seeing spirits all around my house. And I said, you're what? She said, I'm seeing spirits all around my house. I'm, I'm seeing these, these figures everywhere. I don't know what's going on. And we got to talking with what it was. She'd been messing around with a Ouija board. Conjuring up dead spirits, spirits of the dead. And I told her, I said, listen, I said, you play with these things. You're bringing spirits into your home that don't belong there. I believe in angels, but I also believe in demons. And that needs to get, out, get, out, get that out of your home. So she went home. She burned it. Now, this woman is not a Christian. She came back. She said, I can't. She said, I, she said, it scared me to death. She said, I still can't explain it. I said, what's going on? She said, I put it in a barrel. I lit it on fire. And it started screaming at me. She said, I heard screams coming out of that barrel. She said, what is going on? I said, you're getting rid of those evil spirits out of your home. There is a God. His name is Jesus Christ. And there is a devil, and his name is Satan. I said, you play with these things. You bring those spirits in that don't belong. Get them out and profess Jesus over your home. Anoint your home and bring the Spirit of God in, and you'll have rest. This is what the Spirit of God is teaching. The Word of God discovers our condition. And I'm telling you what, folks, we read about these things in the Scripture, and we think, oh, they're so far removed. Oh, no, they're not. They go by new names anymore. We don't see them like we used to see them anymore. But they 100% still exist today. And as Christians, we've got to be armed up in the Word of God to see what's going on and to stay away from them. Otherwise, we bring things in that are a curse to us, that are a burden to us. And we stand back and we say, Pastor, why is God allowing me to go through this? First of all, God loves you. Secondly, look and see what you've brought into your home. Because more than likely, you've brought something in that needs to be on its way out the door. We go a little bit further in this same story. Continue on down here. We go down to verse 15. And the evil spirit, when it said to the chief priest, I'm going back to verse 14, excuse me. And there, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the men in whom the evil spirit leaped on overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the Jews, the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. See, here's the thing, and I want to point this out in Scripture because I don't want to scare everybody half to death. I want to show you something in Christ. First of all, look at the spiritual condition of the Jewish exorcist. They didn't know Jesus. They had no relationship with God. They were saying the words as almost as, as if they're an incantation that had some kind of power. Let me tell you something. The power rests in Jesus Christ. When you have Jesus in your heart and the Spirit of God on, He puts a hedge of protection all around you. He puts angels in charge of you to keep you in all your ways. As a matter of fact, Scripture teaches that little children have two guardian angels watching over them at all times. The Bible even states that the, the angels of babies go before the throne of God every moment of every day. They're before the throne of God. God loves you and He's watching over you. But when you look at the Scripture, this is what it's telling you. It says when you get away from the Spirit of God, you get away from the hedge of protection that exists in God. And you allow things to come in that hurt and harm. The Scripture tells us that the enemy does not come except to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. I remember when my grandfather died. When he passed away. Man it just. Someone just took my heart out of my chest. I just felt so so defeated. I thought man. How could God take my grandpa away? But then I got to rejoicing. I got to rejoicing. Because I realized he's in heaven. With Jesus Christ. He's dancing on the streets of glory. And I got excited. I have for 60 years he preached. And now he made it. He's in heaven today. The second woman I went to college with was a practicing witch. 
She was involved in the occult. And we had several discussions off and on, different moments. And I remember she tried to tell me once about the spirits of the dead roaming around. I'm going to tell you something. No one who believes in Jesus Christ is roaming around here today. They're in heaven with the throne room of God. Deuteron Deuteronomy 18, make that clear. It tells us that when, when we took, go around someone trying to conjure up these dead spirits, you don't listen to them. Because our loved ones who believe in Jesus Christ, they're in home in heaven with Jesus today. They don't want to talk to me. They're busy talking to Jesus. The Bible tells us one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. No more than they turn around, I'll be with them. But in the meantime, they're talking to Jesus, and I'm not about to interrupt them. I'll tell my papa, you talk to Jesus, papa, I'll be there soon. You go ahead and you talk to him, I'll be there in a little bit. But I'll tell you what is here, demons. I'll tell you what does roam around here, angels. And when we read these scriptures, both are evident. As a matter of fact, we continue on in this story in the book of Acts. We continue on here in Acts chapter 19. We continue on a little bit further. Listen to this in verse 17. This became known to both all the Jews, Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Listen to what God did. God took something that was meant for evil and he turned it for his glory. I mentioned the, the lady I went to college with who, who was a practicing witch. I want to tell you, she accepted Jesus Christ before the end of the semester. She repented of her sins. She turned her life over to Jesus Christ because she recognized that there's a power in Him that cannot be mimicked. She recognized that there is something there that you cannot walk away. There's a void in your heart that only Christ can fill and He's looking to fill it. We get so caught up in so many things and we bring so much heartache on ourselves and we say, Pastor, why? Why? Because we start bringing things in that are not of God and they bring with them a curse I tell you anymore I look around me I see where magic is prevalent in every aspect of life anymore I'm going to tell you something there are two spiritual forces only two God and Satan anything that suggests about being in the middle is a lie straight from the throne of Satan there's nothing in the middle there's only those two and you start getting into things, and I'll just go ahead and say them, like Harry Potter, that is witchcraft, that is magic, it is sorcery, it is wizardry, and according to Deuteronomy 18, it is not of God, it is of the devil, and we need to get away from it as a church. You start looking into all this garbage, and we get into all this stuff, we start seeing where it starts bringing curses on us. And you look in America today, you see all kinds of problems going on. You see anxiety. You see all these things running rampant. Why? Because people are drifting away from the truth. The knowledge of truth, they're drifting away from it. God's got great plans for you, church. He's got amazing plans for you. But if you want those plans, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in God. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. You can say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I, I, I'll, I'll lose friends. I learned a long time ago. Finding a good friend is like finding a diamond in your backyard. There's not many. So odds are the friends that you're afraid of losing, they never cared about you to begin with. But there's one that cares. And his name is Jesus. Look at what happened here. These people in Ephesus were practicing magic. Over 50,000 pieces of silver. That's millions and millions of dollars today. Over 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of magic. Text telling people the occult were brought. And they were burned that day because they saw what it was. And God did not just wrap them with a whip and just say, you wicked people. He opened his arms and he said, it's time you come home. The Spirit of God was pour, poured out and he pulled them in. And he said, you're home. The Spirit of God has been released in the city of Ephesus. And revival broke out in the city and on the people. And lives were changed for Jesus Christ. Church, that's what it's about. It's about finding those things that get in our way between God. And we push Him out of the way and we pursue Him with all of our hearts. 
And in Jesus, we find the victory where there is no victory. I remember talking one time, and we're going to talk a lot more about him tonight, but Tom, I remember talking to him. He had so many bad memories of so many things that happened in his life. But when he came to Christ, man, there was a joy that surpassed all understanding that came on him. Because he realized, this is what I've been missing all my life. And I found it late, but I found it. And it changed him forever. And he didn't want anything else the world had to offer. He didn't want anything else. He found what Christ had. Look at John. Go ahead and take your Bibles if you don't know it. But look at John 3.17. Because this is important to look at while we look at these verses here. But John 3.17. Now this verse is important because it shows you the heart of God. It shows you what God thinks of you. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Listen to that first part. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Remember the scripture we read earlier where it talks about God discovering the condition how nothing's hidden from His sight. God knows everything going on in your life right now. He knows every compromise. He knows every filthy word. He knows everything that you've ever done or said or will do. He knows it all. And yet in knowing all these things, he tells us right in this verse, my purpose for sending Jesus into the world was not to condemn you. It was not to condemn you. Why? Because he loves you. The purpose of Christ coming into the world is that you can be saved. Now this is a stipulation in Scripture. This is where we do have to be careful as Christians. Because God says, I'll hold you accountable to what you know. For what you know. That means the more you know about God and Jesus, the more he's going to hold you to account the day that you meet him. The day that you meet him, the more he will hold you to account. Because you can argue with me all day long. You can tell me, Pastor, I don't agree with X, Y, Z, but I'm showing you where it is in the Bible. And as a result, your argument is no longer with me. It's with the Lord. And you're not going to back him down. Why? Because he loves you. And he's telling you up front right here. He says there are things out there that will hurt you. There are things here for your good. There are things here for your good. I remember as a young man, I came to Christ. I remember I, I'd hear the pastor sometimes preach on hell. And I'd hear him talk about all these things. I was scared to death. I bet you I asked Jesus Christ in my heart over 20 times in a one-year period. No joke. I bet you I asked him into my heart repeatedly, just praying that prayer, saying, Lord, now you're sure. You're absolutely certain. You're sure you want me. I, I'm just, I'm making positive here. I don't, the pastor, he's scaring me a little bit. And I want to be certain. And I remember I went home and I started talking to my dad and my mom, and I, I told him. I told them how I was feeling. I told them what I was going through. And they looked at me and they just smiled. And they said, son, you have a heart that God loves. And I'm sharing this with you because I don't want to end on a bad note. I want you to hear this. They said, son, you have a heart as pure gold. God loves you. Perfect love casts out fear. Rest in Jesus. He's got good plans for you. Learn to rest in him. You walk for God, there's nothing to worry about. Church, that is the truth. When you put the Word of God in, it's that warning system that lets you know when you're getting outside of the will of God. That's that little voice that tells you danger, danger, danger. Because God loves you. And He's calling you to Himself to say, come back to me. When you stop putting the Word of God in, when you stop walking with God, that's when all these other things start slipping in and start causing havoc. And then you start getting drawn into things that you really don't want to be a part of. But one day that Holy Spirit will speak to you again. And it's going to feel like someone's just crushing your heart. Why? Because that's what happened when you turned. You crushed God's. And it's telling you, saying, come back to me. Come back to me. And there might be some things you've got to clean up like the people in Ephesus. You may have a lot of stuff that you've got to get rid of. 
but God says you can still you can still come back. Deuteronomy 18, I've quoted it several times today. Deuteronomy 18 isn't there to just beat us over the head. Deuteronomy 18, Isaiah 65, this, Acts 19, so many scriptures all hitting on the same thing, talking about witchcraft, talking about incantation, sorcery, talking to the dead, all these things. Those scriptures touch on every one of them. But it's not telling you that to hurt you. It's not telling you that to beat you up. It's telling you this as a warning, as a warning. Thing, you practice these things, nothing good will come of it. And you will stand in judgment. So get rid of them and come back to God. That's what God is telling us today. He loves you. His plans for you are good. They are to prosper you. They are to protect you, not to cause you harm. So take a moment as we get ready for our altar calls and music comes forward. Examine your heart today. See where you stand with God. You might be looking at some things saying, Pastor, i got some things i got to clean up. There are some things I've really gotten into. And it may not be the things I've talked about today, but it might be something that God's speaking to you about right now where you are. And you're saying, man, i got to get this straight. i got to get this figured out. The music I've been listening to is not good. The, mu- the TV shows I've been watching, man, they got a horrible message. And you're trying to figure out, what do I do? And you come to the altar. And you started off by saying, Lord Jesus, I love you. Please forgive me. And then just let God show you what steps to take next. Because church, a Christian walk is just that. It's a walk. Did you ever go somewhere and you take a walk by taking one step? You don't get far, do you? Take one step. Just open the door, just one step. Well, I'm done. And go back inside. Doesn't feel like you accomplished much, does it? You didn't get outside very far. You didn't burn off any calories. You didn't see anything new. That's where a lot of us are in our Christian walk today. We take one step. Lord, I trust you. Okay, that's enough. I'm going to go back in. And God's saying, no, that's not how it works. That first step is to say, Lord, I trust you. The next is to say, Lord, show me what to do. The next, God, forgive me, I messed up. And you keep walking. You keep walking. Every step is a new adventure. Every step is a new journey. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I've gotten caught up in some things. I really, I, I, I knew better. God, I knew better. But I just don't know what happened. I just, I started in this and it snowballed and I wound up somewhere I should have never been. God, forgive me. That's a step. Say, Pastor, I've been following some messed up doctrines. I, I've just, I've really, I've been looking at scriptures all the wrong way. And I know I've got to change some things. God, help me. That's a step. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He expects you to be dependent. Dependent on Him. Dependent on that Word of God. To say, I don't understand everything. I know some things are bad. I know I've got to avoid them. I don't understand it all, but I love Jesus and I want to follow Him. Then follow Him. Start putting away the things that are against the Word of God. Put those things away from you. Get rid of them. And follow after Jesus Christ. Start having a prayer life. Start reading your Bible. Get serious about your faith. Church, it's not just words. It's actions. It's a life. It's a commitment. It's a desire to know the God of the universe, the one who made you. This isn't just a fairy tale. It's truth. It is truth. This world right now is in a dark place. You walk like the world, you'll end up where the world ends up. But if you walk for Jesus, you're going to look different. You're going to sound different. And eventually you will be different when you walk for God. I pray every single day for my kids. I've got five of them. Five kids. And my wife and I, we talk every day, and I tell her, I said, honey, have you ever stopped to think what our kids are going to have to have to go through? We thought it was bad when we were young. Look at what they're going to have to go through. And so we pray for them. Because the truth doesn't change. It never changes from generation to generation. It never changes. So we pray for them. We teach them the Word of God. 
and we tell them, you keep up that good fight. You take one step at a time. You keep putting the Lord first. You say no to those things of this world. You say yes to the things of God. And I tell my boys all the time, if you stand alone, then you stand alone. You don't move. You stand and you walk for Jesus. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd behind you. It doesn't matter if people are pulling you one way or another. When you discover what's right and true, you plant your feet on it. And young people, listen to me. You don't move. You'll regret the day that you do. Jesus is the answer. You stand on Him. Today, whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, if you just want to draw closer to Jesus Christ, and I hope you do, then you come forward and you bend a knee and you draw closer to Jesus this morning. Husbands, I want to challenge you this morning. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You cannot look at your wife and say, Honey, you do it. You cannot do that. You are the spiritual leader in the home. You grab your wife by the hand. And you bring her to the altar and you tell her, Sweetheart, I need you to pray for me. Sweetheart, I'm going to pray for you. You lift me up. I lift you up. And together we're going to serve Jesus. We're going to make our home strong. We're going to teach our children right. We're going to be unified in the Spirit of God today, honey. And you come to the altar and you pray together. If your spouse isn't here, then you grab your kids and you say, Kids, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for Daddy today. We're going to pray for Mommy today. We're going to lift them up in the Spirit of God. And we're going to pray for our home today. And you pray as a family. I'm telling you, church, the Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. What's a threefold cord? In this case, it would be your husband, your wife, your children. And if you're only two, you're only two, you'll get the third one. But you pray, you pray, and you come forward and you do spiritual battle for your family and for your marriage. Whatever need you have today, whatever prayer you need to pray, husbands, it's time to lead. Whatever you've got, whatever you need to bring before the Lord, today's the day. I invite you this morning. This altar is open for you. Please come.